Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Mike Zephyr. I'm an associate professor uh, in the Faculty of Business and Economics at the University of Melbourne. And this is uh, QMNet, the Quantitative Methods Network here at the University of Melbourne. And today we've got a very exciting speaker with a very exciting uh, topic to discuss, and that is Miss and or Dis. I'm not exactly sure how to turn that into something like that. Miss and or Dis Information Flow in Online Social Networks. Uh, and it's Lewis Mitchell from the University of Adelaide. And Lewis, let me say a few words about you before we get started. That is, or those are, uh, Lewis is an associate professor in applied math at the University of Adelaide, or applied maths, sorry, given the local context. Uh, prior to that, he was a po uh, postdoc uh, in the Complex System Center at the University of Vermont, uh, Go Bernie, where he is now a visiting research fellow. And Lewis's research focuses on social network analysis, computational social science, and data assimilation. In 2000, he was the recipient of the J.H. Mitchell Medal from ANZIAM and a Young Tall Poppy Award uh, for South Australia in 2018. In 20, 2021, that's a funny name for an award. In, in 2021, he is the Chief Investigator in the ARC uh, Center of Excellence for Mathematical and Statistical Frontiers. Um, and Lewis, thank you so much for doing this. Um, really, I've been looking forward to this all week and we're really glad you're here. Thanks so much. Feel free to take it away. Thank you. Um, and I have been looking forward to this too. I mean, when um, you first emailed me, I, I jumped at the opportunity um, to give this talk, um, partly because I was like, maybe by May, the borders will, will be allowed to fly to Melbourne again. <laughs> go to Melbourne um, but you know it's it's fine to be in my own office as well um, and it is lovely to be uh, to be talking to uh, to all of you um, so yeah so this is called um, so I put this sort of NAF title in here of mis disinformation uh, flow so I will um, I'll distinguish between those uh, those terms uh, at the you know a, a little bit into the talk um, fundamentally it's about information um, this is about information flow um, in online social networks and I have cast of thousands of people that I've listed uh, on the slide here, you know, upon whose shoulders I stand um, to, um, you know, to, to give this talk today. So uh, lots of people who have, who have contributed to this effort. Um, I want to particularly call out um, two of these. So Bridget Smart um, is a very, very smart um, master's student um, who has just started uh, with us not long ago. Um, and Tobin South is a, um, uh, is a just completing a uh, master's student who was also very smart um, and just got his comments back from, um, um, from reviewers. They've been working together uh, on part of this project and some, some of the stuff on um, foreign influence on, uh, on Twitter um, that I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and when I hassled them for figures um, to include in this talk, uh, they very um, obligingly um, uh, helped me out with them. So, you know, they are, um, they are two stars. Um, of the future, and I want to call um, both of them out um, because they um, yeah they they they've helped me a lot and they've been um, uh, really great. Um, okay, so we're talking about uh, misinformation, uh, disinformation, and as I probably don't need to uh, tell anybody, uh, um, you know, on this call um, in this talk about misinformation and disinformation are on the rise and they are a, um, you know, they present a, a clear and present danger and there is substantial public concern. So, um, you know, this misinformation and disinformation has become uh, so prevalent and so such a big concern during uh, the pandemic uh, that there's even been a new word added to the, um, added to the lexicon, which only appeared um, in, in 2020, which is this uh, word infodemic that's in the blue it's in the blue curve here. So we don't just have pandemics, you know, as we had the, the, the 2020 um, COVID pandemic, we've had um, the rise of this, um, of, a, of, a, of a corresponding information pandemic, you know, and, and, and a pandemic of, of bad information, of diseased information uh, that we have to worry about too, which is just, you know, which is just great. So this stuff is, um, uh, is all around us. You know, you, you have heard all of these terms before. This is not something you um, of course, um, misinformation and disinformation are, um, are dwarfed um, by the problem of fake news, um, which you can see there, uh, suddenly burst onto the scene in late 2016 um, and has been uh, you know, swamping uh, all of the other kinds of misinformation and disinformation um, 
uh, ever since. Hopefully now it's slightly on the uh, on the decline. So, you know, this is not just something that's um, of interest to uh, social network researchers like myself. Um, you know, talking about the, the the clear and present danger of this misinformation and the the, the public. Um, concern. I mean, it's a public health concern to the extent that the World Health Organization um, wants to publish special issues on infodemiology. So not epidemiology, um, but, you know, the epidemiology of diseased information, right? And so we'll talk about um, misinformation around vaccines and things. You can really understand why um, over the last, uh, over the last 12 months or so. Um, <coughs> so, um, you know, infodemiology is another word that we're adding to the lexicon. Um, now, before the pandemic, um, it's hard to remember because it was approximately 17 years ago uh, now, but before the, the pandemic kicked off, there was, um, there was some concern about uh, uh, misinformation and disinformation um, with the Australian bushfires in 2019, 2020 um, as well. And there was this um, uh, uh, campaign spreading uh, on online social media that, you know, the bushfires were not caused as a, um, as a result of uh, the effects of climate change, but, you know, that they were the result of arsonists setting fires all across the country, which was just completely false. Um, so this, um, nonetheless, this narrative sort of spread, um, you know, gained some traction um, and the culprit, you know, the blame was placed, um, probably rightly so, um, uh, partly on, um, on social media. Right, so on platforms like uh, Facebook and Twitter, uh, where memes and um, uh, a, a narrative, a false narrative um, about arsonists setting these, um, the, the bushfires uh, back then, you know, um, spread. So here's an example of the sort of uh, misinformation um, uh, that got put out there. So arsonists started the fires. And this was a tweet that was in actually in response to Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, the US, um, uh, US Congresswoman, so you know, this really spread far and spread far and wide. You know, this um, misinformation was uh, reaching the upper levels of the uh, of the U.S. government um, via social media. So this was um, you know, a, a really big, um, a really big event um, you know, in those uh, simpler times before the pandemic started. Um, and you know, it's it, it spread from uh, social media. I could go through um, uh, more of this, but you know, it spread into um, fringe news sites, and then many of these um, news fringe news stories got picked up by larger organisations. So there was sort of cascade of this information. So one of the big concerns um, with this sort of bad information um, is where is it coming from, um, and so what we're looking at here is um, in these two bars on the left. Um, this is a study where we took um, Twitter data from uh, that was talking about the bushfires at around you know, the end of 2019, start of 2020, um, and we grouped um, those tweets into uh, uh, um, uh, tweets that were um, sort of pushing or talking about this arson uh, narrative, so climate change denying, um, that's the, the middle bar, the CCD stands for climate change denying um, tweets uh, and climate change accepting uh, tweets the CCA on the on the left there. Um, so yeah, we uh, we labelled um, some of these by the uh, by the hashtags that people were were using, and then we looked at what the country of origin was um, for these tweets. And the thing that you find is that significantly um, more of the arson narrative appears to be coming uh, from countries outside uh, com countries outside of Australia. So one of the concerns that people have um, about these. Um, about this misinformation is that it's not just trolls, right? Like it's not just um, uh, malicious random people uh, on the on the internet. It's not people doing it for the lulls, but it's you know a, a precursor to some sort of foreign influence, right? So there is a, a, a genuine concern to be had there um, about you know, about foreign influence and misinformation. And the other question that you have about this um, is what is the what exactly is the role that the social networks play? Um, so again, with these bushfire um, tweets, when we looked at who was following whom um, or who was replying to whom rather um, uh, with, these, uh, with these different types of hashtags, you found that there was this really, really strong community structure uh, where the climate change denying tweets were all circulating in one community um, <coughs> and the, um, the more benign tweets were circulating in another community. Um, 
And so that's concerning when you think, start to think about echo chambers um, and things. It also, um, uh, you could make, one could also take that the other way and say, well, if the misinformation is circulating only uh, amongst people in one community, um, then does it spread far and wide? Um, you know, is it really much of a concern if it doesn't spread outside of these um, echo chambers? So it's a, you know, there are, there are questions there about what exactly is the role of social networks playing. Okay, so I've talked about um, uh, misinformation and disinformation, and my two headlines that I started off with about the bushfires there, one talked about misinformation, one talked about disinformation, if you were looking closely. Um, so we should distinguish uh, those two. Um, so most people uh, do make a distinction uh, between misinformation and disinformation, um, you know, where misinformation just means you know, things that are wrong, so um, information that is incorrect, so false false stuff. Um, but, you know, um, I probably, uh, I spread misinformation uh, all the time when I say, um, when I say stuff that's incorrect um, in my lectures or something, um, and then I correct myself, right? Um, so um, there's a distinction um, but when I say something wrong, I'm not intentionally trying to mislead people. Um, if I am trying to mislead, then we call that disinformation. So it's trying, it's designed to deceive um, or to take away the information that you already have, right? Um, the beliefs that you already have and replace them with something else. So it's a more malicious intent. And that's a, that's a distinction that people um, use between the two. Um, very difficult to determine what's misinformation and what's disinformation, right? Like you, you are ascribing some sort of intent there. Um, and so for someone, uh, for an applied mathematician um, or a data scientist like myself, um, fundamentally, um, if we're going to understand how this stuff, how either of these spread, you know, fundamentally, we're talking about information, right? Um, if we want to understand how uh, fake news or how um, misinformation or disinformation spreads, we need to understand how information um, spreads online. Um, and that's the sort of, that's the central uh, idea of this talk. So this is sort of a talk um, in three parts. Um, I think this has got sort of three aspects to it. So the first thing I'll talk about is how we might measure uh, information flows. So you know, we are bathed in a flood of um, data um, coming from these online social networks. There is lots and lots of um, data that one can analyze uh, there um, coming from social networks. How can we use that to actually measure information um, or to observe information as, as it is flowing um, uh, from one person to another or across the network? And, so, and then after that, the next idea is um, what I will talk about are some measures based on information theory um, and based on entropy and things to uh, uh, measure, you know, how much you can predict about one person from another. Um, how do we take that um, into actually uh, building maps and building pictures of information flow networks and how can we actually look at the influence um, of this um, information you know, from um, from the individual level up to, a, up to a broader scale. So that's the new stuff. Um, that's a sort of a case study that um, Bridget and Tobin helped with that. I'm really excited about that. Um, if we get time at the end, um, we'll talk about how to um, go from there into mathematical models. So how to actually uh, model um, information flow or information contagion um, in a way that sort of respects this information generating process and underlies everything. So let's start with how to measure uh, information flows. So as a mathematician, um, when I hear information, I think about entropy, right? And which is, um, I think about information theory and the, the governing idea there um, is entropy uh, that has been around since uh, the 1940s. Um, and in particular, because we're dealing with text, we're not just dealing with, um, you know, IID random processes, um, which we're for where it's um, appropriate to measure something like Shannon entropy that uh, some people might uh, know about a very old fashioned, a very traditional um, notion of entropy. You know, text has lots of structure in it um, and we need ways of measuring entropy rates um, that take into account that correlation that there, and that structure that exists in text. Um, so the entropy estimator that we, um, that we use um, is one that looks like, one that looks like this, where the key idea is to measure, um, to take a string of, uh, you know, a stream of text um, and then measure some position in that stream of text. Um, what's the uh, shortest string of words that you haven't seen in the past before, right? 
Um, so, you know, the cat's out on the mat. If I'm at the, uh, the point of the mat, uh, well, I've seen the before, but I've not seen the mat uh, before. That's a new idea. Um, and so I can, I, I can do that string matching and calculate that, uh, calculate that number. Um, and then there is a way um, that's been around for 25 years or so um, to estimate an entropy rate um, based on that. So essentially what this is looking at is if I have a string of stream of text, so a stream of tweets that somebody's writing into the future, this gives us a way to estimate um, how many bits are needed um, to describe uh, to describe the next word um, out of somebody's mouth given their past words. So you know what is my um, what is my uh, inherent predictability um, as I um, write text into the future? Uh, and that connection between information or entropy uh, and predictability goes even further. You can make that formal uh, mathematically. There is something um, called Fado's inequality, where if you can estimate empirically this, et this entropy rate H um, for, a, uh, for a collection of text, you can actually um, define some measure of predictability, which is what's the probability of guessing um, the next word um, uh, correctly. So if you're a high entropy person, um, and you, if it's a high entropy uh, text and you, you write a lot of random stuff that is not highly predictable and its predictability is low, you have a low probability of guessing the next word. But if you are just all work and no play to extract a dull boy, all work and no play to extract a dull boy, um, if you keep saying that again and again, you are very low entropy, high predictability, um, and this relationship um, characterizes that. It's been used by other people um, before um, in this. Um, uh, in this complex systems uh, systems area. Okay, so that's the idea. Um, here's what it looks like um, when you actually apply this to some text. So, you know, Hemingway, um, relatively uh, simple style of writing, right? So for whom the bell tolls um, is lower entropy uh, than Tolkien's the Fellowship of the Ring, complex story, more complex, uh, more complex, um, more uh, complex narrative, higher entropy. Um, this uh, justifies um, why I have never, I feel justified now in never having gotten past page 20 uh, of James Joyce's Ulysses. Um, who would read a book that has an entropy uh, of higher than seven um, bits per word? That's ridiculous, um, very unenjoyable. Okay, so you know, that's what the sorts of uh, scale of numbers that you get for English text um, here. We didn't look at books. We, you know, talking about social media and online social networks here, so we looked at um, the social network from which we could most easily uh, grab uh, data, which is Twitter. Um, uh, so we collected lots of tweets uh, from lots of different users uh, over, a, over a large range uh, of popularities of those users, so a large range of numbers of followers. Um, Twitter lets you collect uh, the most recent 3,200 tweets per user, which is a lot of words. Um, and then the thing that we did that was kind of, um, that was kind of, uh, different, it was kind of unusual here, um, is we having the text of what people had written, so having their complete tweet histories, um, we could then say, well, let's look at who they talk to the most often, right? Who do you mention uh, most frequently? So who are your closest social ties uh, on Twitter? And then we went and collected all of their tweets as well. So by looking at who was the most mentioned, uh, we defined these alters, um, for each ego, and then we collected the, um, the tweets of all of those uh, alters um, as well. And so now we had a huge data set where we could actually look at how much information is there um, about my tweets uh, based on the information that's present in all of my friends, right? And so that's the sort of experiments we did. So just looking at this, um, at these entropy rates um, first, so nothing about the, um, nothing about those social ties, um, one thing that we noticed that's not in the paper uh, yet is that if you, um, uh, if you look at uh, uh, people's entropy um, or the complexity of their language or their predictability as a function of how famous they are, um, famous people tend to, to be, people with more followers uh, tend to be more predictable. Um, I don't really know why that is. It's possible they're just talking to themselves, they're on message um, uh, all the time. Um, and that true ideas, originality is coming from the people like me who have a small number of um, uh, followers. You know, I, it's a, that's an observation. Um, I don't exactly know why that is, but it's interesting. That's um, funny. Lewis, can I ask a quick question? Yeah, of course. Uh, does this include retweets? Mm. We actually took retweets out um, in this 
because we wanted to look at um, we wanted to look at language really. So we wanted to look at um, who adopts a similar style of language um, as their friends. So we wanted to focus on that social question. But you can imagine that retweets were included here. Um, then these predictabilities would be a lot higher because you know I very often uh, retweet stuff from my friends and so I'm essentially parroting them. Right, uh, right. So that right. would have the effect of increasing all of these predictabilities even higher than what we see right. here. Thanks. Um, the, point, the, the point that I want to make um, about uh, this graph here is for the people who, for the information theory fans um, who think, why do you do this complicated thing and not just calculate um, old school Shannon entropy? Well, Shannon entropy doesn't actually, um, because it doesn't take into it, it doesn't respect the ordering of words in language, um, you don't actually see these patterns. Um, you know, there's a lot of information that's contained in the ordering of the words. Um, and so if you want to um, use that in your calculations of your estimates of entropy uh, of these processes of, of this text, then you need to um, you need to build that in. So Shannon entropy actually doesn't sort of uh, work here to show you um, these interesting um, these interesting patterns. Davis, can I ask you a question? You absolutely can. Um, so this uh, entropy, it's a measure of uh, um, how you can predict future tweet, right? Is mm -hmm. that, but how do you understand whether the tweet has uh, misinformation or uh, fake information? Mm. Um, so we don't uh, in this. Um, and generally, um, I'm not going to, um, at this stage, make a distinction. So we're just looking at information um flows here i'll apply in a sec i'll apply this um, these techniques to some data sets where we know there's misinformation um, and we'll look at um how influential that um those in misinformation generating accounts are um but yeah there's um to do to actually look at um misinformation with this raw tool uh, well i'd have to um i would have to build that into uh you know i'd have to um do more than just counting things. I've been needed to count um, words that were associated with misinform misinformation or disinformation, or count uh, certain types of words, um, or do this as a sort of pre-labeling. So something like that is possible. Um, but for the moment, you know, I'm just stepping back and talking about the tool in general. Okay, because um, I, I, I am an economist and I don't have much of this background, but I know that a lot of uh, studying economics, what they do is uh, they, they they plot uh, the world uh, in a vector space and they try to understand uh, mm. the, the distance between these yep. two words, for example. Um, yep. Would it be possible to do something like this? For example, like how much fire and, uh, I don't know, climate change are together rather mm. than fire and, uh, I don't know, um, another words related to arsoning? Yeah, great. Um, that is a great question. And so, yeah, we've thought about these word, these word embedding vector um, approaches. Um, a bit. So yeah, so I'm not doing that here. I'm just, you know, each word is a token and it's all unique. Um, yeah, I mean, that would be um, a generalization uh, of this. That would be really, really interesting to look at. I mean, there's a number of limitations here. And um, one that I'll mention um, straight away is that, you know, even before you get to the sort of similarity, the contextual similarity of words that you might get up with word to back or something like this um, is, we don't distinguish, this measure doesn't automatically distinguish between um, stuff that was said recently and stuff that was said a long time ago, right? So um, there are the things that we could build in, um, uh, that we could build in there. Um, I got one other question in the chat about how do you measure an ego's closest social ties? Um, excellent question. And I, um, I, I skipped over that explanation a bit. Um, we looked at who was most frequently mentioned by the ego. So we counted up at mentions. Um, and, and so, um, uh, yeah, use that as our proxy. So the person who was most frequently contacted uh, by the altar, by the ego uh, was the top ranked altar. Um, and we went down from, went down from there. So that's imperfect, right? Um, because it's a sort of a one way direction of, of communication, um, but it's a sort of practical proxy. But, sort of okay that we can um, get at yeah okay so that's all about this um what we call self-entropy right so the, the how predictable you are based on your own writing your own past writings the same 
computational technique works exactly the same to look at how much um, how predictable you are based on a friend, right? So if we had all of my tweets and all of uh, Michael's tweets and something like that, we could look at um, how often, you know, um, what's the rate at which I copy phrases that Michael uses or something like this. Um, so how much information flows from Michael to me. Now in information theory, that's a cross entropy uh, measure. So it's the predictability, it gives you the predictability of A given B, the predictability of Lewis given Michael. And or something like that. Also not an old, uh, also not a new idea, um, but um, uh, something which actually gives you meaningful uh, results here. So here's an ego um, with its uh, with its 15 alters uh, or so, and I've coloured the edges here uh, by this information flow. So the darker edges show more um, more information flow between these between these users. And what you notice um, is that the, the the links here are whether these people talk to each other or not. So there's a cluster of people who talk to each other, right? and there's a cluster of people that don't talk to each other. The people who talk to each other are actually all sharing information, um, as you might expect, um, for the most uh, for the most part. So there is information flowing between users um, in this community, but not nearly as much in the people who um, are not connected uh, to that community. Um, there's one node in here which is not shared which is connected to everybody, um, but doesn't share much information. <coughs> the, um, the links are not, uh, the links are sort of um, are very lightly colored. Turns out um, when you look at the tweets, this is a network of people who are all interested in um, car racing or interested in um, Formula One driving. And this uh, note in the middle is the account for, um, it's the Italian account for Ferrari. Um, so everyone's talking about Ferrari um, because they're talking about Formula One, but nobody actually is talking about, you know, the publicity and, uh, you know, the stuff that the Ferrari Twitter account uh, puts on its, um, puts on its account. So it sort of, um, it sort of makes sense what's going on. there. So that's cross entropy. So I can look at information flow along edges, along links between people. Um, the new thing, you know, the new generalization that we did here was, well, I mean, we don't just have to look at one person. We can actually write down mathematically, uh, a sort of joint um, or a, a cumulative uh, social information measure, which is how much information is there in my uh, online writings, in my tweets from those of all of my friends. So I can look at a, um, a bunch of different alters um, and look at how much information there is about the ego in the, in the past of all of those alters. And so what we found here um, was, um, was something really interesting. So firstly, you know, up the top here, you see that the um, the blue histograms give you uh, uh, it's a histogram of the entropy of, of people's you know, egos self entropy so how you know, predictable they are from their own writings uh, cross entropies tend to be a little bit skewed towards the right there um, so people are less predictable from their friends uh, from their best friends um, than they are from their own writings as you might expect but zooming in on this figure on the right as you look at more and more and more friends, right? So as you observe the writings of more and more of these alters, so this is where I'm looking at uh, one alter, then the first two alters, then the first three alters, four, five, all the way up to 15. If I start to read all of those, then I get more and more information uh, about the ego, about the person in the center of this circle. And in fact, by the time I've reached about 10 um, alters, nine or 10 alters here, I have, as much information about the ego um, as if I were reading their tweets themselves, right? So in principle, I can make a prediction about the next thing out of the, um, the ego's mouth that's about as accurate um, as if I were reading their tweets themselves. Um, so that's, uh, it's kind of surprising that that number is so low. So that means that if, you know, even if I delete my account, then as long as you, uh, as long as my 10 best friends uh, are still on the account, are still on, uh, still on the platform, or still on Twitter or Facebook, then in principle, you could uh, make predictions about me. You could make predictions about the, um, about the stuff that I was gonna write. You could make, you could, you could write in my voice um, in principle. Um, yeah, the blue curve here is if you have the ego and the alters, so this is something like a, a transfer in, entropy in the information um, theory literature, um, then you always get this bonus. You can do better uh, than if you have um, 
uh, have just the ego by looking at the friends as well. Um, uh, and there are some controls uh, down here. So this is you know, significantly different to, uh, to these controls. Um, yeah, so there's, um, there's a point here to be um, made about predictability. You know, this predictability is a very formal um, mathematical, um, formal mathematical concept. It's very uh, precisely defined. It's a fundamental limit based on information theory and based on just the text um, of how well an ideal sort of machine learning algorithm could work. So this is not, I've built a neural network and I've counted the accuracy um, I've measured the accuracy of that um, neural network in predicting the next word, right? Although I could do that, um, this is a bound on how well those, any such algorithm like that uh, could perform. So this is a sort of more fundamental result um, that is independent of the machine learning technique um, used. And that's sort of the, the nice thing about um, doing information theory or doing mathematics here rather than um, and building a machine learning algorithm actually and, and trying, to do the, um, trying to do the prediction ourselves. Okay, so that's the tools. Um, so now here's the new thing. I mean, this is very much work in progress. Um, how do we take these tools and how do we use them to actually start to, um, uh, to map, uh, to understand uh, networks of information flow? So this is the stuff that um, uh, Bridget and Tobin have been working on for the past few weeks. And what we looked at um, was a very, uh, was a very well-known um, case study. So, um, you know, Russian interference um, on Twitter via the Internet Research Agency um, in the 2016 US presidential election. So Twitter actually released all of the, deleted all of these accounts of these trolls, um, these Russian trolls that were indicted here um, and posted them online. So lots of people have studied them. So 538 looked at, um, you know, shared all these tweets. Uh, and one thing that they did, which is quite nice, was they labeled uh, each of these accounts into different types of trolls. So not all trolls were created equal uh, in the Internet Research Agency. You know, there were um, left trolls and right trolls. So it's not just that, you know, the Twitter trolls were trying to get Donald Trump elected. They were trying to create confusion. And this is what was um, what has been widely reported um, about this, is that you had, you know, pro um, pro Bernie, pro Hillary, um, left wing trolls, people imitating left wing trolls, and you had conservative trolls, people imitating um, conservatives as well. Um, yeah, you had people who were um, pretended to be news feeds, um, aggregate who would you know pretend to be American news outlets, and you had um, uh, people who would just try and glom onto trending hashtags of the day and sort of, sort of spread stories by um, by by playing these hashtag games, we're getting onto those. Excuse me, Lewis. Yeah. Uh, just to be clear, are these groups? Are these groups, sorry? Groups of, of trolls classified in this way or individual ones? Uh, yes. Um, uh, so there are many different trolls. Um, yeah, these blue time, blue and red, these colored time series, uh, all, all accounts that were labeled um, as being left-leaning, like yeah. imitating left-leaning, so, imitating so, right-leaning. Okay, but that must have been done by some classifier or something, by, by Yes, by, yeah. correct. Yes, they did. Um, uh, yeah, that's right. So there's actually, there's lots and lots of accounts here. There's like thousands of accounts, as I'll show you in a sec. Um, yes, and they've actually, and they've gone through and, um, and labeled these. But it's true that these, each account was trying to imitate a persona, right? Like they were trying to, um, they were pretending to be a real, um, American citizen with an ideology. So it makes sense that some of them, if, you're, if your goal is to create discord and, and unrest, um, that you would pit um, different types of personalities against each other. And so what you can see from this is there's some amount of coordination going on here, right? Like um, before the election, a lot of the left trolls are um, coordinating together and that's this spike here. After the election, there's a lot of right troll activity. Um, and you can see patterns here. So questions that we have is from, um, from this data set, you know, how do you measure this coordination? So there's a, there's a very popular um, method in the literature at the moment um, that's been sort of led by people like Tim Graham from QUT, which is to look at the timing of posts, very uh, simple, elegant um, idea. 
You look at when people are tweeting, if they tweet at a similar time, you say they're probably coordinating uh, much more likely than what you would by chance. Um, and you put an edge between those people and you can build these coordination networks. I'll show you one in a sec. Um, the big question is really this one in the middle. You know, do these trolls actually have an effect? Are they actually influencing people? And that's the thing that we want to look at um, with information flows. So here's a coordination network. Um, so Bridget made this using Tim Graham's um, Python toolkit down in the bottom right there. Um, and what it does, and so is, I'll zoom in, um, each node is an account. And uh, if the accounts, two accounts tweet the same URL or tweet the same piece of content uh, within 90 seconds of each other, she puts down an edge, right? So there's an edge between those two, uh, between those two accounts. And so what you see is that the people who are playing their hashtag games um, are coordinating a lot. You know, the left-leaning trolls were tweeting the same stuff at the same time quite a bit. So they're all connected together. And there are these other um, clusters of coordination. And the thing that I want to draw your attention to is that these right trolls, the people who are uh, pretending to be uh, conservative um, Americans, American users on Twitter, there's not many of them actually. They actually hide their coordination pretty well. You see a couple of them up here <laughs> towards the top of the screen, a couple of others connected to the yellow um, cluster over there, but there's not many of them. Right? So it appears that they're not actually tweeting the same stuff at the same, at the same time. So what we did, and this is what Tobin did in the past few weeks, I'm um, using his own um, uh, uh, tool, Python toolkit for calculating these cross entropies, is he calculated the cross entropies between all of the users in this, in this set. The colors on the side here show you um, the red ones are the right leaning trolls, the blue ones are the left leaning trolls, and the yellow ones are everything else. And then each entry in the heat map is, the, uh, is a measure of the information flow between the two of them. It's a difference in the cross entropies. And so what you see, what you notice is that there's this clump of right-leaning trolls here. And so this is where there's quite a lot of accounts here. There's you know, tens of thousands of accounts um, among this. There is an information flow. So the lighter colors are information flow from these red um, right-leaning trolls to many of the other, uh, to most of the other groups here. So there is some sort of information flow that we can see that's going from the right leading trolls to the other types of trolls. So even though they're not coordinating in that sense of tweeting at the same time, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, even though they're not coordinating in that, um, in the timing sense, there's information that's flowing there. And in fact, if you look at, um, if you just look at these different types of trolls and how they're, and the average information flow between the two of them, then it seems like the right trolls, uh, like everybody's copying the right leaning trolls somehow. Um, so yeah, there's information flowing um, from the right-leaning trolls. You know, it's, it's almost like the left-leaning trolls are picking up on the stuff that the right-leaning trolls would have, have said and then copying it back as they argue uh, with them. And so in terms of influence, it appears like you know, the right-leaning trolls are the influential ones. Um, so that's something that's really interesting. This is very new. This is like in the last um, week or so. And you know, I'm showing you really preliminary results here. Um, but the point is that this shows you something different, something that's very distinct, uh, I think, from the, um, from the coordinated activity network, where these right trolls don't show up uh, very much at all. Um, it shows you that they actually potentially have influence among this network of trolls that exists. So the open questions here is that, um, you know, um, uh, can we explore influence, you know, beyond uh, this network now. So in some sense, it's not that interesting, like who's influencing whom in this um, network of trolls, right? Because each one of these accounts is a person sitting in a room, um, um, you know, typing out garbage to post onto Twitter um, to try and um, sow discord about the US election. We really want to see, is there information flow from this network into the rest of the Twitter sphere? And that's, you know, there's a lot of subtlety with that question, but it's something that we've got the tools to do. So coordination is not influence. Um, information flow is also not, you know, it's not true influence, um, but it gets to something closer. Um, yeah, and so, you know, the network structure is clearly important here. It's really exciting to me that there's a clear network structure uh, when I look at that heat map on the net left. 
um, but it's an information flow network. It's a different type of network now. There's, a, there's knowledge to be gained at both of these levels. So we get to the, uh, the, the question here, um, you know, the very natural question for an applied mathematician, which is how should I model, uh, how should I model this? Um, and now I'll, I'll, I'll go a little bit quickly um, through these, uh, through these last few slides. So I've got time for a few questions. Um, but, you know, this is a third part of the talk, you know, introducing a model that's, um, that tries to capture the spirit of some of this information flow stuff that I've been talking about. So, you know, um, this, is, this is not the first time that, uh, this will not be the first time that information flow on social networks has been studied. There's a huge literature uh, looking at different types of contagion uh, on social networks and, you know, in a very um, prevalent way to model uh, information flows uh, online is to use something like a disease model, right? To take that analogy of the infodemic even further and actually use the same mathematical models um, as we use for diseases um, for information. So, you know, you're susceptible to a piece of information, then you get infected by it, and maybe you recover later. And there's a few different paradigms here. Simple contagion is very appropriate uh, for real, for physical diseases in that the more people you're around who more of your neighbors who are infected, the more likely you are to get infected as well. Um, more used in the, uh, in the um, complex systems community and probably more appropriate is what we call complex contagion, where you won't adopt the idea until some fraction of your friends has talked about it, right? You need some, some larger proportion of people before you have any chance of being infected. Um, Sorry, let me go back because I've got a question. Did you look into measuring composition of each troll's network and perhaps its effect as influence? Um, yeah, not yet. So, you know, um, just to finish this off, what I've shown you here is um, all we've looked at so far. Um, I'm showing you stuff that's um, pretty uh, hot off the presses. So yeah, this is, um, we really do want to look at and delve deeper into this network structure here for each of these different types of, um, each of these uh, different types of uh, bots here and, and really understand this network. But yeah, we're just at the start of this. Uh, okay, so you know, different types of contagion produce different um, types of results, uh, coming back to information contagion. So, you know, as the network gets more dense, as there are more people um, closer to you in the, uh, in the network, a simple contagion where the probability of getting infected just goes up, you know, the, the size of the outbreak just goes up, which makes sense. Complex contagion is kind of weird in that if you have, if you have lots and lots of friends as the network gets very, very dense, um, to get to infect a large fraction of those friends becomes difficult. So you have these uh, hubs who become start to block the information flowing and you get this decrease actually in the, in the size of the outbreak into the, the size of the, uh, you know, the mean. This sort of seems pathological, but this sort of decay here is the, com is the characteristic feature of complex contagion. Um, there's big issues with all of this which is that, you know, these SIR type models, these disease models are not necessarily realistic um, models for how information spreads. You know, they don't measure anything. They don't try to model anything about how you actually generate information, right? They all rely on this um, social reinforcement function. So you specify this is how, um, this is the fraction of people who get, um, who, who need to be infected to infect me. Um, and then you plug that into this disease model and you, you go for it, right? It's not, you know, where this function comes from is, is, is pretty unknown. Most importantly, you're not talking about information anymore with these models. You know, people are either susceptible or infected or they're recovered, right? You either believe in uh, the idea or you don't. You, everything is now a binary state. Um, Ian. Yeah, way, way back when it goes to, it, it relates to the rumour model idea, mm. isn't it? Where, yep. as you say, it's, yes. it's, you either heard the rumour or you haven't and so on. And yep. Daryl Daly yep. and Co in the 1960s used it to look at that. Yep, yep. And um, uh, I think it was Charles Pierce here at the University of Adelaide actually um, did, some, uh, did some work on these rumour models um, where you can have people who will suppress rumours as well. So people who, um, who are, yeah, you know, yep. try to counteract it. So sure. it's an interesting sort of yeah, my dear, but, but that is exactly the paradigm that we're talking about here. Yeah. Um, but the point is that you are either 
You either have the information or you don't. It's a one zero thing and that's not what information looks like. So the model that we're starting to use now um, that we're, um, we've been developing is this thing called a quota model um, where um, you actually generate streams of text where each person in the network writes and draws words out of some vocabulary distribution. And then with some probability, you write something new or you copy something that one of your other friends um, has written. And so it's a nice simple um, model, but it captures that idea of actually copying stuff that your friends say or retweeting if you're something, if you're online. And what's actually really nice about this, what's really surprising to us is that with this model, it actually looks like complex contagion. So this characteristic decay that you get here in complex, this, this non-monotonicity um, in this epidemic curve, you get the same thing arising from this quota model. And it's got, you know, it seems to be related to your ability to quote from all of your friends um, at, much, you, at once. You can only sort of quote so much. And so you, there is this blocking effect, um, but it arises without the need for this social reinforcement function. Um, yeah, so it actually captures something about complex contagion. Um, same thing happens in real networks. It looks like the quota model looks a bit like complex contagion in real networks. Um, yeah, and it's it's a really um, exciting model that we're starting to we're starting to develop. So I presented you a, a, a stuff a lot of stuff that's mainly at the start um, here rather than at the end. Um, so you know we can measure. We have these tools for measuring information flow. Uh, we're starting to learn how to map these things. And we've got a model that we're starting to um, use that actually captures some of the nice characteristics uh, that we might want to uh, that we might want to use. Um, Ian, I'll take that. Let me just do my last slide and I'll come back to your question. Um, but we're really only at the start um, of all of this stuff. So um, there's much, much more that we want to do in terms of mapping. Um, in particular with the quota model, there's no fitting this to data yet. I mean, the, the next big step for us is to actually try and um, do some inference on this model um, and ultimately you know, into the future we'd like to um, build network models generative network models out of this idea so if you're more likely to connect to people who share similar types of information can we predict the emergence of echo chambers um, and things like this um, so yeah so that's it i'll stop there with a picture of the team um, thank tobin um, and bridget again uh, for helping me out this week uh, and thank these various groups down the bottom um, who see uh, who think this research is similarly interesting to me. So thank you very much for your questions, everybody. And I've got time to take a few more if you have them. Maybe I should take Ian here. Um, yeah, what's thanks. the axis on the contagion quota graph? Do you mean this one or this one? Um, oh, you muted Ian, but that's okay. Um, Sorry, what is K again? Yeah, I've just forgotten. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I did. So um, I didn't explain that. So this is the average degree uh, in the network. So it's a measure of how many friends people have. So as you go out to the right, um, the network gets denser, right? There's more people have more and more friends. So you have more and more social contacts. And so as you have more and more social contacts for a, a physical disease, you're more likely to get, you know, the epidemic is larger, but there's this bizarre property in complex contagions where, um, yeah, more famous people are, it's, it, it's, it's difficult to um, infect a large fraction of, their, of your friends. I like that people turn their video cameras on to ask questions, it's, it's very human. <laughs> I have a question actually. Yep. Uh, yeah. Thank you for the presentation uh, and uh, I was wondering if you wanted to measure the composition of a red trolls network uh, based on uh, the types of the network uh, the trolls, how would you go uh, about it? For example, uh, uh, measuring the composition of the network of a red troll having red trolls versus uh, blue, yellow, white trolls. So how would you go about it? And uh, why do you think the density inhibits the information flow? Actually, two questions now. Yeah, okay, two <laughs> questions. Uh, I mean, the answer to the first question is, I don't know, because we haven't done it yet. Um, the thing that, um, but the thing that jumps out to me about this is the, there's this block structure, right? And so there is a, a big literature 
um, in this network science um, uh, um, literature about stochastic block models where you have um, you know, communities that are sort of urdish um, you know, just random graphs with some probability of attachment and there's some different probability of attachment between all these different communities. So I'd probably start with looking at something with something like that. I mean, it's even more appropriate for the coordinated activity networks where you have some high probability of connection um, between these um, between these green blobs and a low probability of attachment between the um, green and the yellow blobs and you can do some inference on that you know it's more even more complex than that though because there's some hierarchical structure here right? and there's this core that's very very densely connected um, and then it's, it goes out from there so yeah so I'd start with something um, something like that I think um, yeah what was your second question again oh density uh, the, information yeah yeah, so it's, um, uh, where's it gone? Oh, um, I mean, I didn't talk heaps about that. Basically, we found that um, uh, when we did these simulations, uh, the denser the network is, um, it appears to uh, inhibit the information flow. So as you get uh, denser in this direction, um, the information go de goes down and you see the same thing here. Yeah, the average degree and the density is sort of related here. Um, I think it is between, because the way we've set up the model um, is, you know, at each time step, you quote from one of your neighbors, right? And so as it gets more and more dense, you can only quote from, um, you can only quote from one of those neighbors at a time. Um, so the chances of you, getting influenced, you know, um, uh, copying a bunch of text from one of your neighbors uh, goes down um, relatively. And, you know, you also always have the probability of um, quoting yourself. So uh, it's, it's to do with the way that we've set it up there. I mean, it sort of ends up simulating, I think, you know, this cognitive load, like you can only take in information from so many people um, at a time. It's a thing that we Sort of find out the model. Thank you. No worries. Um, any other questions? So, one of the uh, one of the ways that you've um, identified uh, who is in kind of a shared network of disinformation, um, like identifying some of the bots. Um, they, I mean, they could be human trolls, right? Yep. Or, or they could be bots, right? Like, yeah. we're not exactly sure. Yep. Okay, so, uh, <clears throat> so one of the criteria that was used for doing that was retweeting within ninety seconds. Yep. Um, okay. And that's, you know, obviously they can develop methods for just delaying it longer if they want to. Yep. Um, <clears throat> but it, it kind of struck me that that might be an interesting way to go about, or I mean, I'd rather just the parameters on how we might identify um, trolls yeah. and um, yeah. and bots. Yeah. Disinf oh, di yeah. Right. Disinformation trolls and bots. Because it's interesting, if you look at the history of the Russian government when mm -hmm. it um, comes to disinformation or misinformation, which I think is a term coined by Stalin, right? And um, he gave it a, uh, um, he, he wanted it to sound like it was British or, or sorry, French um, in order to, uh, and here's this GEC report on Russian disinformation, which is kind of interesting from the US Department of State. And so he wanted it to have this European sounding name, but, but, the, but the key to doing it properly was not just planting false information, but, um, but also ensuring that everybody in the network, the entire network knew that it was in there somewhere. And that undermines trust in the entire thing. Mm. So, <clears throat> so being able to identify who's, you know, like who the bad actors are is obviously yeah. incredibly important because that undermines the ability for this technique to work at all. Um, yeah. And then the question is, have you looked at, and I don't even know how you would do this given the Twitter data, you probably couldn't. You would probably need some kind of al alternative method for doing this, but how a network changes once the actors within the network or the nodes become aware that certain mm. other actors or nodes are in fact peddling disinformation, whether it's there, whether it's humans or bots, it doesn't matter. Yes. Um, yeah. 
but it would be interesting to look to see what effects that might have um, within just in terms of network structure. Yeah. 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 I don't know how you do that though. Okay. Um, well, there's lots of things there. I think your um, your comment about bots versus trolls is totally right. Like, I think this is a very good way for detecting bots where there's an algorithm that they tweet the same stuff. And I think it's yeah. not a coincidence the hashtag gamers really, which is a very algorithmic um, sort of thing. Um, you see those. You see those here. I think you're on the money with that. And I think these, you know, I think these coordinated activity networks are still super useful. And, you know, there's potentially a way to distinguish between the, the human and the bot actors in looking at both <clears throat> together. And of course, you know, the IRA is a, um, is the uh, uh, um, internet research agency is a mixture of, definitely was a mixture of um, humans and, and bots. You know, there were right. 18 or something um, humans indicted and there's thousands of accounts here. There's absolutely bots uh, mixed in with, with people here. Um, yeah, as for how the network rewires, I mean, that's, um, yeah, that's something that we, that's something that we want to do. Like I think about, um, yeah, I think about doing this by through the, sort of through the quota model idea, by um, uh, taking, um, by putting some rewiring probability into the network based on quoting. So if you have more of a propensity to quote one type of person, um, that should change the, and you could build that into the evolution of the network structure. Um, and so you could see potentially echo chambers forming or things like that. Um, yes, I think what you're talking about is then the next step. Um, I mean, as you, um, yeah, I mean, we would have the ability to look at these information flows over different time windows, different time periods. Um, so yeah, if people change their behavior and, and stop looking at something, you should see a corresponding drop in this information flow, um, then be my hypothesis. So yeah, I think the tools are, are there. Um, to well, actually observe it in real life means you've got to you'd be churning it, um, you know, yeah, looking, yeah. looking across a large amount of data over an extended period of time. So, but yeah, that's the, definitely an idea. It's kind of interesting. It's an empirical question, to, uh, you know, the extent to which this thing will, as you, as, as you say, rewire itself. Because mm. uh, one thing that you seem to hint at was the fact that um, on the left and the right, the network seemed to behave slightly differently. Yeah. And I think that this is true on the left when people become aware that disinformation is out there they they find it distasteful and they yeah. and they try to steer away from it but on the yeah. right what we're seeing is almost the exact opposite mm. they see it as a useful tool and they're happy to deploy it and so mm. knowledge of the fact that one of the nodes might be again it wouldn't even matter if it was a bot or a human to some extent it's it becomes useful right. um for their agenda and so i'll bet you that the left might rewire itself whereas the right would probably be more right. resilient right yeah you're you exposing might them um yeah actually um, says yeah. the academic yeah. <laughs> the lefty yeah yeah um no i like that um, hypothesis um like i think that that's a nice thing to try and test absolutely cool okay anybody else uh that was that was absolutely fantastic that's super interesting um good question do we call yeah, it's a Friday now at 3.10. Should we call it a day? What do you think? Yep, that sounds good. Okay, Thank cool. You oh, absolutely. My goodness. Thank you so much for, for doing it. Pleasure. I'll try to come along again in future. Uh, yeah, cool. Yeah, definitely. Ian gives a thumbs up as well. Yeah. Uh, so <clears throat> thank you, and uh, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>